Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Wanderlust. Thank you, Naropa. Super happy to be here. I think I need to do that Jack Kerouac writing class. That sounds fantastic. So I want to start with an invocation that's maybe a little bit different than your usual invocation. I want, by a show of hands, for you to tell me if you know how to actively de-stress. Actively de-stress. So raise your hands if you know how to actively de-stress. And keep your hands up. Keep them up if you're doing it two times a week. Right on. Right on. Some tentative hand raising here. <laughs> keep it up if you're doing it five times a week. OK. That's why you're here. And how about if you're doing it every day? Fantastic. So we have our Olympic de-stressors in the room. You know who they are. So I want to present a case today for actively de-stressing and to give you some of the why behind yoga, behind meditative practice, and also give you some novel ways of actively de-stressing. And it may be a little different than what you're used to. I'm not going to tell you to relax, because that's not what I want you to do. It's a much higher state of physiology if you entrain the two halves of your nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, the half that does fight or flight, and the parasympathetic nervous system, the half that does rest and digest. So I'm going to teach you how to do that, how to entrain them today. How does that sound? All right. So this is me doing yoga outside my house. I'm a working mother, and sometimes you just have to do yoga by any means possible, even in cowboy boots. So that's how I do it. We're going to be talking about seven ways, seven prescriptions to rock your cortisol and thereby rock your mission. Here's what we're going to cover. I want you to ask yourself today, how is my cortisol? How is my relationship to stress? What's my perceived stress like? I've got a long questionnaire in my book that assesses your cortisol levels. There's many different ways to do that, but we'll get started with some of those today. I also want to talk about men versus women. What do women do differently than men? Then we're going to do our seven prescriptions, seven novel ways to de-stress, all of which are in my purse right here. And for the guys who are a little worried, they're thinking, oh, great. Her purse. She's got the de-stressors in her purse. There is such a thing as man purses, right? I, I saw a few guys <laughs> with purses, so um, this is for all of you. And then I'll also cover where to get more help, because we all need more help. In fact, getting help raises your oxytocin. What does oxytocin do? There will be prizes. You have to shout it out. Lowers cortisol, yes! What else does it do? Makes you feel good, right on. So it is the hormone of love, bonding, and affiliation. Autistic children are low in oxytocin. Their receptor for oxytocin, which is kind of like the lock on the door of a cell, and the hormone oxytocin fits into that lock like a key, their receptor for oxytocin doesn't work well. It's wonky. So we need more oxytocin. Very important. And then hopefully we'll have a little time for Q&A. And if we don't have a ton of time, I can also answer more questions with the book signing. So I want to start with my own sad story. <laughs> this is me in my 30s. I was working in what I would call McMedicine. Does anyone know what I'm talking about with McMedicine? So the average appointment in the US is seven minutes long. The average appointment with the doctor is seven minutes long. I don't even know what you can accomplish in seven minutes, but somehow I was doing it not very well in my 30s. I was seeing 30 to 40 patients a day, and this is a typical lunch hour for me. And I know the photo is kind of dark, and some of you are way in the back. Maybe your eyes are better than mine, but I just want to point out. Is there, oh, a laser pointer. So here I am on the phone. This is a typical lunch hour. I'm standing up. I know you can't see that, but standing up lunch, kind of gulping down bites, 
while talking to patients. Big stack of medical charts in one arm, wearing this ridiculous white doctor's jacket that I don't wear anymore. And I was just, I was miserable. I was a stress case. I'm gonna sit down. I, um, I had PMS. I had about um, two good weeks. It sounds like I'm getting emotional. My nose is just running a little bit. It's very dry here. <laughs> the Kleenex comes in later. It's one of the things in the purse. So I had premenstrual syndrome. Does anyone know what PMS stands for? I like to call it pass my shotgun. <laughs> can anyone relate to that? I imagine even the guys can relate to that because when I was writing my book, my husband was one of my readers, and as he went through my book and he was reading the chapter on cortisol and then the chapter on progesterone, he said, guys need to read this book. It's going to make their lives so much better if they understand when to help their woman and what to offer her in a very gentle way, like what supplements, chaseberry, for instance, for PMS, and then also when to run. <laughs> Fight or flight, this would be the flight part. So I had PMS, I had low sex drive. That's one of the effects of chronic stress. Chronic perceived stress. I blame my husband for a lot of things. We were in couples therapy. I had a bit of a victim-y attitude. You know, oh, I'm working so hard at this health maintenance organization. I would come home at the end of the day and I would pour myself a big old glass of wine. And guess what, that doesn't work very well. It raises your cortisol higher. The very thing that you think you're getting from alcohol, it's actually robbing from you. Sad but true, I love a glass of wine. So this was me in my 30s. I had what I would call the three Fs. I was frazzled, fat, and a total frumpster. <laughs> I weighed about 25 pounds more than I do now. And I went to my doctor, I did what many women do, men too. I went to my doctor and he offered me three things. A birth control pill, which is the answer to every hormonal problem that a woman has under the age of 50. And then over 50, it's, it's hormone replacement therapy, right? Number two, an antidepressant. So at this time, it was vitamin P. What's vitamin P? Prozac, yes. And number three, he told me to eat less, exercise more. And that was a defining moment for me. It was a surrender point. Because I realized a couple of things. Number one, I realized, okay, I feel really bad that you're telling me to eat less, exercise more, and that it's just a matter of simple math. That doesn't sit right with me, and it feels like you're telling me I just need more willpower. And I had a hunch my problem was hormonal, and I didn't want to just mask the symptoms with the latest antidepressant. And I certainly didn't want to go on the birth control pill because guess what? That can shrink the clitoris by up to 20%. I'm a gynecologist, so you know the clitoris is going to be somewhere in this conversation today. <laughs> it also robs you of testosterone. We need testosterone. Just like cortisol, we need testosterone to be in the Goldilocks position. Not too high, which you see with polycystic ovarian syndrome, and not too low, which is linked to low confidence, low agency, being able to assert your power in the world, low sex drive. So we want it in that zone where we feel good. When you go on the birth control pill, it brings your testosterone down to the floor, very low. Some women, genetically, have really efficient testosterone receptors. So remember, this is like the lock on the door of a cell, and testosterone fits in there like a key in the lock. Some women have what I would call Prius receptors, meaning that they're super efficient. Even on a teeny little bit of testosterone, they do just fine. Their sex drive is fine. Their clitoris is fine. Their confidence and risk-taking is fine. And then the rest of us have the Hummer type of receptor, which is a total testosterone hog. And if you don't have a sufficient level of testosterone, you're gonna have vaginal dryness. In fact, up to 25% of women on the birth control pill have vaginal dryness. 
and most of them have no idea what's going on. They went on the birth control pill to have sex, and then sex becomes painful. They're thinking, I'm not menopausal. Why do I have this vaginal dryness? Am I doing something wrong? Because women are really good at blaming themselves. So I don't think the birth control pill is such a good solution. Quick thing on antidepressants. I want to be careful not to give you an either-or perspective on this, because certainly antidepressants can be life-saving. In severe depression, and that's the minority of men and women who take them. So one in four women in the U.S. is on a pharmaceutical for mental health. One in four women between the ages of 40 and 55 are on an antidepressant. One in seven men are on a pharmaceutical for mental health. Very few of those people have severe depression. One of the things we've learned recently, not only do antidepressants rob you of sex drive, but they also increase the risk of breast and ovarian cancer. It's a modest increased risk, but it's something to think about. I would rather go to the root cause, which is what we're talking about today, and it's also what I have talked about in my book, because I think when you address the root cause, you're much more likely to have a sustainable result, right? Okay, so that's me. I had a hunch that my well-meaning well physician did not have the best protocol in mind for me. And I was right. I was also a runner. Are any of you runners? Yeah. So my doctor was saying exercise more, run more, do more miles. Running raises your cortisol. So I had a hunch at this surrender point when the pain of staying the same was worse than the pain of change. And I had a hunch that I had a hormonal problem. So what I did was I tested my cortisol level. I stepped into the grace of being a biohacker. I'm from California, so we use terms like biohacker all the time. Has anyone heard that term before? Tim Ferriss, Dave Asprey, yes, right on. Okay, so biohacker, that's where you leverage medicine, genetics, tracking, testing. You leverage that to improve your biology. And I want all of you to emerge 40, 50 minutes from now as official biohackers when you leave the door, okay? So I, I had a hunch that my problem was hormonal I tested my cortisol in the morning, and it was three times what it should have been. So I did an AM blood cortisol, and it was 30. Ideally, you want your morning cortisol to be about 10. So I was three times what it should have been. And these are some of the things I had been trying to improve how I felt in my cortisol including Ambien, chocolate. I was actually onto something here. <laughs> As you will see in the purse. Pole dancing. I got the prescription to Prozac. I didn't fill it, but I had the prescription. There's the wine. Crying. Lots of retreats. Diamond approach. Adderall, Xanax, the pill, exercise, naps, ice cream, tyrosine, Wellbutrin. I tried many things. None of them really worked until I tested my cortisol. And I, I want to give you kind of a why here. Why should you bother with this? You know, maybe you feel like, oh, I don't have a problem with cortisol. Let me go through some of the symptoms, and then we'll talk about telomeres. How many of you have heard of telomeres before? Telomeres are the cute little caps on your chromosomes. A lot of the work on telomeres was done by Elizabeth Blackburn, who's a totally hot biochemist at the University of California, San Francisco, and she happened to get the Nobel Prize for her work in 2009, woo! So telomeres are the caps on your chromosomes. You want them long and lovely. You don't want them to prematurely shorten because telomeres are one of the best proxies, one of the best ways of measuring your biological age as opposed to your chronological age. And when I was in my 30s, I was aging too fast. 
I wrote a guest post for Wanderlust about the cost of being a badass. Have any of you seen that? So I talked a bit about the cost of being a badass. One of the costs of being a badass is that sometimes your cortisol is out of control. Too high or too low, sometimes both within the same day. I mostly am a high cortisol person. I'm a bit of a cortisol junkie. I'm a recovering cortisol junkie. So some symptoms of cortisol being out of balance. Sugar cravings. Feeling like you just need a little something in the afternoon, usually of the chocolate variety. Feeling tired but wired. Having difficulty winding down before you go to bed. Another thing that I see is people have a second wind at night and they think it's such a good thing. Oh, I'm so productive. You know, it's 10 o'clock, I'm on the internet, I'm like so focused. Yeah, you should be in bed. <laughs> you should be having the adrenal repair conversation between your heart, your brain, and your adrenal glands. Very important to be in bed by 10, to have the full conversation. That conversation has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I see so many people who have the beginning, maybe the middle, and not the end of the conversation. You need the whole repair conversation every night. If you didn't get it last night, you can catch up tonight. So telomeres, so I just want to make sure that you understand that it's not like a temporary problem when your cortisol is high and you're feeling tired but wired. It has long-lasting effects. And the cool part is, it's not how much stress you have heaped upon you or that you invite into your life. It's the way you dance with the stress. It's your perception of stress. And a lot of this work, I feel like the universe is talking to me, they like that particular part. So from the work of Elizabeth Blackburn, what she found was that women, premenopausal women, we're talking about women in their 30s, women in their 30s with high perceived stress, on average were aging 10 years faster than women with a normal amount of perceived stress. And the way that Elizabeth Blackburn studied this, I thought it was brilliant, she looked at women who had a child who was, who was sick, women who had a child in the intensive care unit at the University of California, San Francisco. She called those caregiver women, caregiver moms. And she compared them to women who had a healthy child. That way she could control for the moms, right? And she could also control for age. And she didn't find that the caregiver moms had the problem. What she found was that in both groups, the women with the highest perceived stress were the ones that were aging so fast. So it doesn't take a sick child, it takes high perceived stress. It's all about the perception and being able to rise above the fray, which is one of the things we get from yoga, right? To develop that witness self, where you're able to look more objectively at your own stressors and how how you dance with them, your relationship. So stress affects the body in many ways. This is one of those slides where people start to have their eyes glaze over because so many of us have had conversations about stress. You know, that same doctor who shall remain nameless, who offered me the, the Prozac and the birth control pill and told me to, you know, stop overeating, he, he told me I needed to reduce stress. And that is not my message to you. My message is, you don't need to reduce your stress. You need to manage your stress, manage your cortisol. Manage it like you manage your 401k. Turns out it's a totally tangible hormone that you can manage. And all hormonal problems lead back to cortisol. 91% of the men and women who work with me in my practice, and I've seen 20,000 in the past 20 years, 91% have a problem with cortisol. So this is a very common problem of our modern age. So there's a long list of things that happens with stress. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can kind of imagine here, your brain's affected. One of the things that happens when you have chronically high cortisol is that your hippocampus, how many of you have heard of the hippocampus? Excellent. So the hippocampus is the part of the brain where you do memory consolidation and also emotional regulation. We need that. It gets fried 
in Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease starts in your 20s. High cortisol will shrink your hippocampus. We don't want that. We want it to be large. I used to think in my 20s that I was immune from hormone problems. I didn't have to worry about hormones until 50 plus, and then I would worry about it. You know, I would fall off the cliff with menopause. And it turns out that your hormones start to change in your 20s. 28, according to traditional Chinese medicine. 28, according to Western medicine. The optimal age for having a baby in the female matrix, the female body, is 24. I know almost nobody who has children at 24. <laughs> Certainly not in Northern California. So we have to figure out how to manage these hormones so that they're not managing us and so that we're not falling down a hormonal flight of stairs. Other things that happen, you can have symptoms of attention deficit. You can burn through your happy brain chemicals. We're talking about the brain here. So things like serotonin and dopamine. Serotonin is that brain chemical responsible for mood and sleep and appetite. My assistant calls it Dr. Serotonin. <laughs> <laughs> so we need serotonin, and women have about half the serotonin that men have. So there's some vulnerabilities that women have that we need to address. It doesn't mean that men are off the hook. Men just respond to stress in a different way, as we'll describe. A few other things, definitely stress raises your heart rate, it raises your blood pressure, it can cause something called incoherence, where your heart rate variability, the amount of time between your heartbeats, goes down, your adaptability goes down. We'll talk more about that in a moment. It also can impact your gut. High cortisol will damage the lining of your gut. And as Dr. Mark Hyman talks about, pretty much all of your disease begins in the gut. We gotta love up the gut. That's the next 10 to 20 years of medicine. It affects your sex drive. I don't know what this purple thing is here, but <laughs> <laughs> seems a little weird to me. There's like this androgynous person with a big purple thing right here. So sex drive can go down. In fact, all of your sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, the father of testosterone, all of them go down if you're a high cortisol person because cortisol is the priority. It raises your blood pressure, it raises your blood sugar, it keeps you alive. And so the lower priority hormones, like estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, will go down at the expense of your high cortisol. That's what I mean by all paths lead back to cortisol. So what about the men? Well, we know that men definitely have an issue with memory, sleep, concentration, and judgment when they're under stress. Now, it pains me to say this because I'm a feminist, but stress favors men. They do not have the same rates of dysfunction with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis, which is kind of like your way of dealing with stress. So women are much more likely to have a wonky HPA than men. Now, there's other things that women do better. You know, the original research on stress done in the 1930s by Walter Cannon at Harvard Medical School. Harvard takes credit for a lot of the original studies, but this is one case where they actually did do it. <laughs> <laughs> With apologies to my professors. So Walter Cannon did the initial research on the stress response in the 1930s, and he did it on men. So this whole fight or flight response was defined in men and assumed to apply to women. And it wasn't until the 1980s and the 1990s that Shelley Taylor and her group at USC, UCLA, UCLA, found that women don't respond to stress the same way. We tend and befriend. So fight or flight is what men tend to go to, I'm generalizing here, of course, and women tend and befriend. Women who tend and befriend do better. Women who go into fight or flight and become hypervigilant don't do so well. Higher rates of PMS, higher rates of polycystic ovarian syndrome, higher rates of fatigue, 
thyroid problems, weight gain, especially at the belly. So we gotta do differently here. Another big difference that I think you won't find in conventional medicine, one of the things that I think about a lot in integrative medicine is the concept of organ reserve. So I'm trying to build a case for you to care about this. And organ reserve is the capacity of an organ to function beyond baseline needs. And when you're 18 years old, you have about eight to 10 times the organ reserve that you need. And that's why when an 18 year old gets into a terrible accident, they bounce back. They have so much organ reserve. By the time you're 80, you have about 20% of that original organ reserve. And you have a choice about how fast to burn through your organs, especially these organs right here, those lovely adrenal glands that sit on top of your kidneys. They're about the size of a pencil eraser, and they secrete the cortisol. They secrete testosterone and progesterone and estradiol. We want to preserve your organ reserve. Another way that I think about this is natal chi. How many of you have heard of natal chi? So natal chi is a type of energy in the traditional Chinese medicine system that you're born with. You're born with a certain amount that you receive from your parents, and it can't be supplemented. You receive a fixed amount, so you have to conserve it. And I feel like this is a common resonance, organ reserve and also your telomeres. So these are some of the costs of being a badass. These are some of the costs of having cortisol that is out of control and not managing it. So we're gonna become biohackers before you leave today. What you measure improves. So I'm a big fan of measuring. A free way to measure your cortisol would be to do my, my free quiz. And I'll just mention that URL. I think I've got it later in the, slide, in the slides, but it's thehormonecurebook.com forward slash quiz. And you can test yourself and see if cortisol's a problem. It's a shorter version of what I have in my book. You can also ask your doctor to check your morning cortisol. You can test it on your own. I have a list of all the labs in my book where you can test yourself, your cortisol levels, if your doctor's unwilling to do it. So if you've got cortisol in the Goldilocks position, some of the things that you develop include stress resilience. You sleep restoratively. You have that adrenal repair conversation every night. Your energy is consistent. It's not low. It's not up and down during the day. Your blood sugar is stable. You don't have those crazy sugar cravings or you know, getting irritable if you don't eat every four hours. And your mood is upbeat because we know that these neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, they are interdependent, they cross-talk with these hormones, with cortisol, with your estrogen levels, with testosterone. So we wanna keep that cross-talk going as, as well as it possibly can. So let's step now into some of the ways that you can rock your cortisol, now that you've gotten all the bad news and you're totally depressed. <laughs> and I just wanna start off with a quick little story I talk about cortisol, I like to make these hormones come alive because if I just stood up here and talked about the biochemistry, you would all be asleep. Like it's torture to go through the biochemistry. So I like to really give these hormones personalities. And you may have heard this one before, but I think of cortisol as being the bad boyfriend that you dated <laughs> in high school or college. And I, I know that many of you know what I'm talking about, and even the guys can relate to this. You know, the one that took you out for drinks and fast food at two o'clock in the morning, and you knew it was gonna end badly, but you went there. Cortisol's a bit like that, indulging cortisol, indulging your stress. And when I launched my book, I got an email one day, this was in May, and, um, it went something like this. So I was at the gym, and I turned on the TV while I was on the elliptical, and there was this woman on the Ricky Lake show, 
And I was, you know, I'd had this meal of wild Alaskan salmon and avocado and dark chocolate before I exercised. But this woman on the Ricky Lake show was saying that cortisol is like the bad boyfriend that you had in high school or college. And I just wanted to know, am I cortisol? So this was from a boyfriend of mine in high school who saw me on Ricky Lake talking about the bad boyfriend hormone and he wanted to know, am I cortisol? So I reassured him, no, you are not cortisol. It was actually the guy I dated after you, but <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but yeah, there was a cost. So the bad boyfriend hormone, it could also be the bad girlfriend, right? So number one, pranayam. And I, I want to talk about pranayam in a different way. I know many of you have done Nadi Shodhana, right? Raise your hand if you've done Nadi Shodhana. Hopefully most of you are raising your hand, yes. Okay, well, I'm, we're going to run through this now. And I want you to have beginner's mind as we talk through some pranayam. Here's what we know. You know, I love to talk about the science, because I think the science is one form of the truth. I think an even better form of the truth is when you take science and you integrate it, you calibrate it in your own body. So rather than me telling you, okay, your first prescription is alternate nostril breathing, five minutes every day, go! What I want you to do is I want you to feel what alternate nostril breathing feels like in your body, because that's the ultimate truth. So the first thing that I have in my purse is Kleenex. For um, those of you who are feeling a little dry here in Colorado, and uh, if you need a Kleenex, I brought the whole box from my condo. And I want to talk a little bit about alternate nostril breathing. Here's what we know based on the science. I mean, we know it's a good idea just from ancient texts from India. But did you know that it's been proven in a randomized trial, which is the best evidence we have, to improve your problem solving. It lowers your blood pressure. It lowers your heart rate. It lowers your cortisol. So many blessed things. So Nadi Shodhana, as you may know, in Sanskrit it means Shodhana is to purify. So you're purifying the energy circuits, the nadis of the body. And there's a mudra that you use, a gesture. What does the four finger stand for in terms of mudras? Ego. Ego, yes. Middle finger? So there's, it's harder to find, actually, the middle finger. I mean, you can kind of imagine what it stands for, but... Let's just call it impatience. <laughs> so the mudra is that you take your forefinger, your ego, and you take your impatience and you fold them in. And you use your thumb and you use your ring finger and your pinky to alternate the nostrils. So we're gonna do this together. It won't take long. So I want you to find a comfortable seat. I know some of you are slouching over a little bit. So feel that tailbone energetically, plug it into earth energy, and then lengthen your spine all the way through your crown. Have your mudra, mudra ready. We use the right hand traditionally. You can use either hand, but the right hand is for giving. So we're giving ourselves the purification of the energy channels. The left hand is for receiving. So you can close your eyes or close them 90% or you can watch me if you're not familiar with this. You want to exhale through both nostrils. Then use right thumb to close off the right nostril. Inhale, left nostril. Hold. And then cover with your ring finger and your pinky, your left nostril. Exhale, right nostril. Cover with your thumb, your right nostril. Inhale, left. Exhale, right. And one more round on your own. Getting your breath slow and smooth.
And when you feel complete, you can drop your hand to your leg. So anyone notice a difference in their cortisol? So this is one of the ways of balancing the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. It's one of the ways of entraining, of creating synchronization between the two. If you are a hypervigilant type, if you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning remembering some deadline and trying to figure out, did I do that? What day is today? Oh my gosh, what else am I supposed to do today? One of the best things you can do is you can activate the parasympathetic nervous system right there in bed, on the spot, close off your right nostril, inhale, left nostril. That activates the parasympathetic nervous system. But we don't want to run around just with our parasympathetic nervous system activated. It's true that most of us hang out a little too much in the sympathetic nervous system. We want to create entrainment balance between the two. And Nadi Shodhana does that. So number one, Nadi Shodhana. And when I practice Nadi Shodhana, I have two children. I have to put a tiara on my head. <laughs> because <laughs> I have trained my children to respect my tiara time. <laughs> So most of us do not have enough self-care time, right? Especially once children are part of the mix. So whether that's metaphorical children, you have a mission in the world, or you have actual biological children. And I've trained my kids to know that mommy's taking tiara time. <laughs> 15 minutes. I'm not going to help you with your homework. I'm not going to make you a snack. 15 minutes, I can help you afterwards. And I do Nadi Shodhana. I call a girlfriend, and this is for the guys too. We know that one of the best ways to upgrade your health for the guys is to be with a woman. For women, one of the best ways to upgrade your health is to be with other women. <laughs> <laughs> so call a girlfriend, take your tiara time, very important. So we're gonna go through seven different ways to manage your cortisol. Next one is cocktail hour. And I happen to have a wine glass in my purse. But this is not, maybe not the cocktail that you're thinking of. So here's what we know. I mentioned already that my beloved wine raises my cortisol. It also clogs up my liver. And at a certain age, 35 plus, you're more inclined to have estrogen dominance. And so three or more servings of alcohol per week make you make more estrogen, increase your risk of breast cancer. Sad but true. And then if the liver is clogged, you're more likely to have estrogen do a backflip into a bad estrogen and thereby increase your risk of breast cancer. So we don't want that. It also makes you fall asleep more easily that night, but it robs you of the kind of sleep quality that you need to have that full adrenal repair conversation. So it erodes your sleep quality. One night of bad sleep raises your cortisol. So we don't want that. So here's your new cocktail. Holy basil. What's another name for holy basil? Tulsi, yes. Phosphatidylserine, I spelled it for you. I mean, the good thing about Google is that you don't need to know how to spell it. You just type it in there any which way and it'll come up. Phosphatidylserine is an extract from the membrane of plants and it does this amazing thing. It improves your mood within one hour. And it lowers your cortisol. Omega-3s. How many of you have omega-3s in your refrigerator and you sort of remember to take them? But not every day. That's what I find in most of my patients. So I want you to get religious about this particular cocktail. So that's your cocktail. I'm going to give you a few bonuses beyond the seven because I, I just can't help but serve you. And I want to mention, um, I had a photo of MC Yogi. How many of you know MC Yogi? I'm a huge fan. When I first heard him play and first attended one of his yoga classes in Point Reyes Station, I said to my husband, OK, I've got a new man crush. It was on Mark Hyman for a very long time, and now there's a first place tie between Nick Giacomini, MC Yogi, and Mark Hyman. So um, still first place tie. And I say that with so much love and respect to his wife, who's here in the front row. So 
MC Yogi is at noon today. We're going to make sure we get you out in time. He's, play, he's teaching yoga, a mashup of his own tunes plus the Beastie Boys, and um, nothing could you know, lower my cortisol more <laughs> than hearing that combination. Music lowers your cortisol. It's one of the reasons why we love to listen to music. So MC Yogi, that's uh, number 2.5. Number three, the pound of vegetables. I want you to have a pound of vegetables a day. You don't have to have it all at one sitting. I want you to have vegetables at breakfast, vegetables at lunch, vegetables at dinner. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but sometimes when you're traveling or you know, you're visiting some friends who don't eat the way you do, it just doesn't happen. When you eat more of gluten, more of dairy, more of grains, the non-vegetables, it tends to raise cortisol. It does in my body. So I have intolerances to gluten and to dairy, and that raises cortisol when I eat them. So you want to be careful about that. You want to make sure that you're getting your vegetables. No white stuff. Stay away from gluten, dairy, and sugar. They raise your cortisol. The other extreme also raises cortisol. So people on Atkins, people who are eating the Atkins food plan also raise their cortisol. So food is very powerful, very powerful. So let me tell you about Jill. Jill's 38, she's slightly stressed out. <laughs> Hypervigilant, she has a hot amygdala. Does anyone know what that is? So your amygdala is where you perceive threat and some of us have a very hot amygdala. We're just like constantly scanning for threat, right? Sometimes in, in our marriages, sometimes at work. She was a workaholic. She felt like she was constantly running from task to task, which is a classic stress measure. And so what did we do for Jill? Well, first of all, I reassured her. This is a really interesting slide from The Economist in 2010. How many of you read The Economist? Okay, we've got a few people. I don't. Um, but I, I love this slide because this is a, a measure, a gigantic study that was done by Arthur Stone. And he looked at psychological well-being according to age in the US. Mm -hmm. And this makes so much sense to me. It's called the U-bend because this is shaped like a U. And what that means is that over here, when you're 18, 19, 20, maybe you're going to college, maybe you're a ski bum, but you're having the time of your life, your psychological well-being is really good. And then you hit your 20s, and then your 30s, and there's like this long period at the bottom of the U where life is hard. And then fortunately, things start to perk up again in your 50s. So I'm really looking forward to this point right here. And uh, hats off to all of you who are 50 plus. So this is called the U-Bend. And so first I reassured Jill that, you know, a lot of women have this experience of feeling stressed out, feeling like they're pushing a rock up the hill. They feel like they're Sisyphus. But we also did some measurements. And we found that Jill had a particular gene variant. So I'm going to bring in a little gene here. It's called the short serotonin transporter gene. Have any of you heard of this before? short serotonin transporter gene. So it's, instead of having the two long genes that shuffle serotonin around her brain, she had two short little genes. And so serotonin did not get transported efficiently around her brain. And the tendency, if you have this, and 40% of Caucasians have this, the tendency is to feel like you're pushing a rock up the hill to have a hot amygdala, to feel like you're stressed out no matter what you do. I think a lot of people end up in yoga like I did uh, when they have a short serotonin transporter gene. So this is one of those genetic tendencies, a gene that encodes for multiple things, makes you more likely to be depressed, more likely to have post-traumatic stress disorder, more likely to have fibromyalgia, an altered pain threshold, and that's what Jill had. So here's the short transporter, just to give you a visual. These are two nerve cells, neurons. And here's the nice, long, normal transporter. 
shuffling the serotonin from one neuron to the next. And here's the sad little short serotonin. Oh, and it's just not very efficient. These people have to work so much harder. One of the battle cries that I hear from women who have this and men who have this is, it's not fair. It's not fair. This doesn't feel fair. Life should not be this hard. I was certain that I had a short serotonin transporter gene, and I was stunned to find that I don't. <laughs> I have other problems, but I don't have this one. So the short serotonin transporter gene. So what we did for Jill is we realized she needed more oxytocin. She needed more oxytocin in her life. She had something called cortisol resistance. You probably have heard of insulin resistance, and that's where your cells become numb to insulin. The lock is jammed. You can also have cortisol resistance. When your body is just constantly flooded with too much cortisol, your cells give up, the lock gets jammed. And that's much more likely in someone with the short serotonin transporter gene. They actually call it glucocorticoid resistance, but it's a little harder to understand. Cortisol is one of the most well-known of the glucocorticoids. Okay, so Jill needed more oxytocin. How do we do this? I have a clue here. Hugging, yes. So Paul Zak, who's one of the world experts on oxytocin, he says based on the half-life of oxytocin in your body, you need to hug eight times a day. So that's one of the prescriptions that I want you to fulfill today. Make sure you find eight people to hug, and not just you know like that little social hug where you barely touch each other, but like full-on Obama-Michelle embrace. <laughs> When I saw this on election night, I was just like, oh yes, that is a hug. So this is your prescription, you need a hug like this, whether you're an Obama supporter or not. <laughs> Hugging, very important. And then one of my friends, Chip Conley, wrote a New York Times bestseller, Emotional Equations, and he did a nice job kind of defining this, connecting now to your mission, your calling. He says that your calling is a simple equation, it's your pleasure, divided by your pain. And as a yoga teacher, I would probably say, well, pain's inevitable. How about if we make this suffering? Because suffering is your choice. That relates back to perceived stress. But suffering doesn't sound quite as good as pleasure divided by pain, so we'll just leave this for now. So we need to increase pleasure. You can't change pain. You can change your perception of pain, but you can increase your pleasure. And one of the best ways to do that in the male body and the female body is with orgasm. So I've got my friend Nicole Daydon here. Does anyone know about orgasmic meditation or OM? So this is just one of many practices for raising oxytocin. We know that within one minute of an orgasm, you get flooded with oxytocin. For the guys in the audience, it increases 500-fold. So this is a very excellent way to raise your oxytocin. And by the way, when you hug a guy, they need to be hugged three times longer than a woman needs to be hugged for the same bump in oxytocin. So hug the men longer. It's one of the secrets to a successful marriage. Hug the men longer. So this is Nicole, and she is surrounded by people who are oming. She is devoted to the art and craft of the female orgasm. And she started a group called One Taste. She combined practices from Zen Buddhism with stroking the clitoris for 13 minutes into a practice called orgasmic meditation. And it's a very powerful way for women to increase their oxytocin. So I mentioned this, um, you know, not everyone is wanting to take off their pants, especially in a group setting, and have their clitoris stroked. <laughs> There's many ways to raise your oxytocin. I'm not saying this is the only way, but you know, another point that I want to make here is that I see a lot of women who are stressed and they get to a point, especially in a long-term monogamous relationship, around four years or sometimes after that, they get to a point where they would rather mop the floor than have sex with their partner doesn't matter if it's male or female, this happens. It's a little worse, actually, when it's two female partners. So I think it's very important to have strategies for how to deal with that. 
and this is one of your tools, one of your prescriptions. I don't want you to settle for what I would call the climactic sneeze. And by that I mean, we all know that a woman can have an orgasm within about one minute with a vibrator, also known as Bob, battery-operated boyfriend. <laughs> Hitachi Wan, maybe 30 seconds. And I don't want you to settle for that because the female body does much better with a longer experience of orgasm. It doesn't have to be multiple orgasm, but it's tumescence. It's when you, you kind of fill your pelvic sponge and you have a whole body orgasm. And it's not just the climax. It's not just kind of the male version. And both men and women have access to this. OK, I'm going to go back to being G-rated now. So number four, leverage oxytocin. That's the point here. Hug, orgasmic meditation, just don't go for the climactic sneeze. The female body, it just doesn't really do much for them to have a one minute orgasm. So the pelvic sponge needs to be really filled. We need to like release that fluid, fill up with that fluid and release it. We need to leverage our tumescence. And the guys who figure this out, uh, your life will never be the same. <laughs> Number five, master sleep. Master sleep. We're almost done with our seven prescriptions. And I want to say a couple of things about mastering sleep because this is another one where I think so many people have gotten advice. They know they need to sleep. They're just busy. And I, I want to give you a couple of whys. W-H-Y. So have any of you read Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers? Good. So he talks about a study that's really interesting. And I just want to take a moment to describe it. There's a study where they looked at, in Berlin, music students. And they followed them over time. And they divided, for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to simplify it a little bit, they divided the group into those who became concert violinists, the elite violinists, and they compared those to the group who became music teachers. And I'm not disparaging music teachers by any means, but it's interesting to look at the differences between the two. What they found was that the concert violinists were so focused about the way that they practiced they would practice for three and a half hours a day. And they would have what I would call a sprint recovery model, where they would sprint in terms of their focus and their practice in the morning, and then again in the afternoon. And they were so focused about this particular time where they would devote themselves to mastering the violin. And then they would recover afterwards. Now, I gave you a recovery. One really good recovery is to breathe through your left nostril. And they had those sort of recovery patterns. Those who became music teachers would fit in practice wherever they could, kind of haphazard. They weren't so focused on the timing of their active practice. They also slept less. So the elite violinists slept on average eight and a half hours a night. They had that full adrenal repair conversation so that they, they could learn and they could hyper-focus with their practice each day. And those who became music teachers slept on average about seven hours a night. So one of the takeaways here is that I want you to aim for eight and a half hours a night. Figure out how to master your sleep. It's one of the key ways to manage your cortisol. I noticed that MC Yogi is playing at 8.30, so I'm still gonna get into bed by 10 o'clock tonight. That's called catching the angel train because the hours before midnight count about double the hours after midnight. So try to catch the angel train. You can still catch MC Yogi. Dark chocolate, thank goodness. So dark chocolate, this may be the most popular study that was ever done on cortisol. And what we know is that dark chocolate lowers your cortisol. Maybe this is the reason why women especially love to have chocolate. I'm not supposed to step out of my little boundaries here, but I'm going to. So you got a prize, Amanda. And I'm just going to throw, i got to make sure I don't hit you in the face. 
So share it with your neighbors because it's going to lower everybody's cortisol. Dark chocolate, hooray. And then number seven, coherence. And you'll be able to take this in even better if you have a little dark chocolate. So I think I have my iPhone here somewhere. Anyone have their iPhones on them? I noticed a lot of iPhones walking into the room, and this is one of those places where I'm not going to tell you to put your iPhone away. So the very thing that seems to be maybe your nemesis sometimes, you know, being so connected, being so on all the time, can also be your release. It can also manage your cortisol. I did a video for Wanderlust on something called GPS for the Soul. Did anyone see that? So GPS for the Soul, I, I feel like I should, oh good, you're having some chocolate, I'm so glad. <laughs> So GPS for the Soul is a free app that you can download, GPS for the Soul, and it uses the technology of heart math, which I'm going to describe for you in a moment. Another free app is called Inner Balance, GPS for the Soul and Inner Balance. The cool part about GPS for the Soul is that when you download it, you turn your iPhone into a biofeedback machine. And using this technology, it's been shown to reduce your cortisol by 23%. 23%. That's pretty amazing. Here's how it works. I mentioned earlier that the time between each of your heartbeats is called heart rate variability. And it's a way to measure your adaptive flexibility. So people who have low stress resilience don't have good heart rate variability. They're low in coherence. And you can change this. You can change it with GPS for the soul. You can change it with inner balance. With GPS for the soul, what you do is you put your finger over the camera lens, and it measures your heart rate variability through the camera lens. Is that amazing? Totally cool. So it's free. It was um, put out by HeartMath and also Huffington Post. <coughs> So I've got some posts in there. You can read a little bit about how I use it. And then another way to use it is with inner balance. It's something that I use quite a bit in my practice. Inner balance requires one additional step, which is there's a little ear clip that hooks into this part of your iPhone, and it measures your heart rate variability continuously via your ear. It doesn't hurt. So you need that extra little setup, but it's a way of training on your iPhone. So I'll just show you a couple of slides related to this. So here's an example of, on the top, I know not all of you can see this, this is the heart rate variability of someone who is angry. It's very jagged. We know that people who have this kind of heart rate variability tend to be type A personalities, they tend to die earlier. They have higher rates of heart disease, high blood pressure. This is very well demonstrated. I first learned about this at Harvard Medical School in 1989. You can train to amplify positive emotions like appreciation, love, connection, and it completely changes your heart rate variability. This is coherence. This is that synchronization between your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system that I want you to focus on. That is the prize. That is the process. So I used to think that the brain was in charge. I used to think that the brain, the mind, was in charge of what the adrenals do. And I was wrong. So after looking at the latest evidence, here's what we know. The adrenal glands listen to what the heart tells the brain. You want to amplify your heart intelligence. Many of us know this metaphorically, but now there's science to prove it. And these are some of the techniques that you can use to amplify your heart intelligence. I'm going to take you through a quick exercise. I also have a, I'm doing a free webinar with the head of HeartMath next Tuesday. And you can sign up for that webinar at sarahgottfriedmd.com, sarahgottfriedmd.com. So the adrenals listen to what the heart tells the brain. And this is what it looks like on the iPhone, the inner balance. It basically gives you a little sensor, this mandala. 
It gives you a sensor for how to track your breathing. And then it also gives you a readout of your coherence. And it, ma it makes it ridiculously simple. It's basically a stress machine. So sometimes I'll pop this thing on and I'll be in the red, which means you could do better. <laughs> Cortisol's high. Get that bad boyfriend down into the neutral zone. So when you get more coherent, shown here in the green, that's where you have the entrainment between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So let's go through just a quick coherence. You can put your notes down for a moment. This will just take two minutes. And I want you to start first by taking your right hand, the giving hand, and put it over your heart. And you can close your eyes or clo close them 90%, just settling into your breath and feeling the weight, the heat of your hand over your heart. Feeling your heart rise up to meet your hand, feeling that connection. And focusing your attention on your heart Maybe on that still place deep inside your heart. Step two is that you imagine inhaling into your heart and exhaling from your heart. Keeping your breath slow and steady and casual. Inhaling into heart. Exhaling from your heart. Step three is to consider someone you love, maybe a person, an animal, or an event, something that went really well for you recently. And just imagine that person or that dog or that pet, something you're grateful for. And as you breathe, breathe in the appreciation for that person or that animal or that event. And when you feel complete, you can gently drop your hand and open your eyes. So that's a quick coherence practice. HeartMath has hundreds and hundreds of these, but it's a way that you entrain these two halves of your nervous system. And I'm a big fan of external accountability. I wish I could do it all on my own, but I've learned that when I have an objective way of measuring my stress and my stress resilience, like my iPhone, which I can carry in my purse, I have it with me almost all the time, it's very effective for me. External accountability is very effective for me. So that's one of the reasons why I suggest this to you as a prescription for managing your cortisol. And it's proven to lower cortisol by 23%. It also raises DHEA, which is a good thing. We wanna have a balance between the wear and tear hormones like cortisol and the growth and repair hormones like DHEA. So here's the recap. Number one, pranayama. Number two, cocktail hour. Number 2.5, go to MC Yogi, listen to some music. Number three, pound of vegetables a day. Number four, leverage oxytocin, eight hugs a day. Number five, master your sleep. Number six, dark chocolate. Number seven, the technology of heart math, inner balance app, GPS for the soul. I want to thank you. Here's that quiz that I mentioned, the hormonecurebook.com forward slash quiz, if you want to see if you have an issue with cortisol. And I just want to finish by saying thank you so much for your rapt attention. I don't know if we have time for questions or if we need to move to the book signing. Questions. Two questions. Okay. So, yes, in the back. Yeah. <laughs>
excellent question. So the question's about caffeine. How does caffeine relate to cortisol balance? I could probably talk about that for an hour. And uh, I'll try to just give you some headlines, okay? So caffeine, the most psychoactive substance that we have in our lives, one of the most commonly used psychoactive substances in the world, raises cortisol. Some forms raise it higher than others. And as you may know, the data is really mixed when it comes to caffeine. There was just a study earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most prestigious journals that we have in conventional medicine, showing that people who drink caffeine, especially coffee drinkers, have lower rates of mortality. But it's a little bit tricky. Here's why. I find that those 91% of people who come to work with me, either online or in my medical practice, the 91% who have a problem with their cortisol, many of them are using caffeine as a crutch. They're using it as a high interest loan against their adrenal glands. So they wake up in the morning, they haven't had that full adrenal repair conversation, they certainly didn't get 8.5 hours like the concert violinists, and the, the only thing they can think of is, get me a cup of coffee, please, don't talk to me until I have my coffee. And this is a loan against your adrenal glands. We know that if you look across the board at people who have coffee, and even if you cut them off at 7 o'clock in the morning, they have their coffee at 6.30, it disrupts the quality of their sleep that night. Now, I don't think of it as either or, I think of it as both and. And so what I would ask you, and what I would ask all of you is, are you using caffeine as a crutch? Are you using it as a high interest loan? Or do you use it medicinally? So for instance, I have a genetic variant in my prefrontal cortex, where I do my executive functioning in my brain. I have a genetic variation such that I don't make a lot of dopamine. It's why I have a little attention deficit. And when I drink green tea, it helps me make more dopamine. I can feel it. If I drink a couple of cups of coffee, I go way past that medicinal effect. So I know pretty clearly in my body what it feels like. I also know genetically that I'm a slow metabolizer of caffeine. Now, another issue is that when you harvest coffee beans and you process them, often there are mycotoxins, mold, that get involved. And so one question now is whether some of the data that we have looking at caffeine and how it raises cortisol levels, whether that could relate to the way that the coffee beans are processed. So when I drink coffee, which I do occasionally, I usually drink a form of coffee that doesn't have any mycotoxins. It's been proven to be free of mycotoxins, and I feel different on it than I do a conventional cup of coffee. So those are some of the issues. I think it, it really is a personal decision. If I have someone who comes to see me who's got high cortisol and or can't sleep at night, I tell them they really need to get off of caffeine and see what it feels like. What I find for a lot of people is that when they come off of caffeine, they are much more attuned to their subtle energy. And they bypass that attunement when they're addicted to caffeine. So as I said, I could talk for hours, but that's uh, hopefully a, a quick response. Yes, ma'am. I have a twofold question about sugar. Sugar, uh, yes. So you, you suggested dark chocolate, but most dark chocolate has sugar in it. Yes. So that's my first part. Yes. And the second part, are there any sweeteners or, or things like that that don't raise cortisol levels? Yes. Like, like cane sugar? Yes, good question. So um, dark chocolate, so the, what I generally recommend with dark chocolate, you know, it's very rich in antioxidants, and I recommend a high cacao count. So my preference would be that we run around eating 80% or higher in terms of cacao count, because that has less sugar. I also, my research has shown that pretty much all sugar, all sugar substitutes are linked to um, this vicious cycle that can be created in the body of raising blood sugar, raising insulin, 
and getting into this cycle of you know, kind of chronic stress, more sugar, sugar cravings, raising blood sugar, higher cortisol. It's a vicious cycle that we want to break. So I have found that stevia is one of the forms of a sugar substitute that is less likely to do that, but we're still in the process of trying to gather all the data. You know, five, 10 years ago, there was data suggesting that agave, for instance, doesn't have the same glycemic impact as regular sugar. And then there's newer data showing that it's just as bad as table sugar. So this is one of those things that keeps moving in terms of having more research and then updating kind of where we are with it. So I'm a fan of stevia if you need to have sugar or that sweet taste. I think stevia is a good choice. Try a lot of different varieties. A lot of people don't like the aftertaste. And I think there's certain forms that are less likely to have that aftertaste. And there's several cousins or derivatives of stevia. You can even get dark chocolate that has stevia in it. Get it on Amazon. Okay, so I think that's everything for today. Thank you so much for being with me today. It's my honor to serve you.